everyone. This is Dr. Deanna Minnick, who give you the uh, webinar this evening on anti-inflammatory foods and living. So thank you all for being here tonight, making the time to learn more about uh, what constitutes an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. In fact, um, if you'll note, um, the original invitation said cooling down with anti-inflammatory foods, but I thought that as I was putting together the information, what might be of greater benefit is to talk about how we can live anti-inflammatory lives. <laughs> so this is an educational webinar that's put on by Harmony Hill Retreat Center, and they, they've graciously done that and offering this support to all of you to give you more information about nutrition. And uh, for those of you that I've met in person, uh, good to have you back again. And for those of you I haven't met, I look forward to meeting you during one of the, the cancer retreats. All right, so let us get started. Uh, I just want to mention, too, we have Victrina on the line. She uh, works with Harmony Hill, and she's going to be fielding any kind of technical issues that anybody might have with the webinar itself. So you can just simply uh, in the chat function in the chat box, you can chat with her specifically if you're having any problems hearing me or seeing the slides. And hopefully you're able to not just hear me but to to see the slides as well. That's the, the best possible combination. Some of you may not have access to the slides uh, because you're not in front of a computer and so I'll be uh, very descriptive so that you won't necessarily need the slides. Okay, so um, just for, I think that this is really a hot topic speak, right? <laughs> a hot topic. Um, there, there is so much about inflammation these days uh, in the news. You probably have heard it about, uh, well, from your practitioner, from friends, from family. So it's really making its way out there. And so the idea with inflammation is that what we want to do is start to put out the flames as best we can and start to rebuild the body with new growth. It's very hard to engage in the healing process when we have inflammatory markers that are high in our body and overall we're, we're, we just, we're, we're feeling on fire, so to speak. So it's really important. It's almost like a house. If your body was compared to a house, we'd want to put the fire out first and then repair the house. Same body. I also want to mention too. Um, I'm going to be asking questions throughout, and if you have questions throughout, the reason why I'm doing this is is for you. So if you have questions, please ask them of Victrina in the chat box, and she'll relay the question to me. So we get this uh, new growth. So let me ask you the first question. I already uh, warned you that there'd be questions here. So the first question is, how do you know you are inflamed? What does it mean to have inflammation in your body? It usually means that you have one or more of five different characteristics. So I'll ask you the questions, and you can assess for yourself whether or not that means that uh, that, that question applies to you in some way. So the first question is, do you have pain? Pain is one of the, the hallmarks of inflammation, feeling a pain in a joint, in a tooth, um, in, in eye pain, um, a skin pain, wherever it is in the body, a gut pain. Having some form of pain denotes that there's some type of inflammatory process at play. The second question is, do you feel heat? Well, by the very nature of the word inflammation, got the word flame in it. So there's some designation that inflammation relates to heat in some way, the production of heat, because of all of these inflammatory markers that are increasing. Think about that for yourself. Do you have heat somewhere in your body? So you can feel it. Maybe it's right after an injury where you know that, that whole process of of inflammation that, that gets into gear and you start to feel the heat, you start to get swelling and redness. Redness and swelling are the two other hallmarks of inflammation. And 
And finally, the fifth one is loss of function. Think about that for yourself, and I'd just like you to assess, are inflamed? Do you have pain? Do you feel heat? Do you have redness? Do many of the redness and the heat go together as well as the pain. Do you have swelling and do you have loss of function? Many times, indeed, all of these things come together in a cluster, but have varying degrees of these things. So I don't know if you remember back in 2004, this was in February, the Time Magazine cover had on the front page the secret killer, the surprising link between inflammation and heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases, and what you can do to fight it. I would say that this is really where we started to, to hear a lot about inflammation in the mainstream literature and in, in the, lay, um, the lay press. So thinking about those hallmarks I just mentioned, the, the redness, the pain, the swelling, you have a chronic disease that is connected to inflammation. And there, there are any number of different chronic diseases that have inflammation as the foundation of the disease. So Time Magazine cover surely mentions some of those. But think about any disease that ends in itis, so ulcerative colitis, uh, diverticulitis. Many times that is already denoting that there is inflammation. Okay. Cancer is something that um, is very specific to what Honey Hill focuses on, and there's a lot of good science and medical literature that's coming out now to suggest that cancer has inflammation involved, that there are inflammatory processes that are at work, and that continues to... Uh, overall, continue the cancer process. So inflammatory bowel disease, things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, arthritis. Think of one of the biggest itises that there could be. Sectoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, psoriatic arthritis. So many types of uh, itises there, right? Just within the bones and the joints. Um, infections, if you happen to come down with a, a cold or a flu or, again, back to the, the mouth infection, tooth infection, eye infection, skin infection, any type of infection, and typically these are more short-term, but sometimes these infections can go on for a longer time. Allergies, whether seasonal allergies, food allergies, um, environmental allergies of all types, with some type of inflammatory response that's being uh, cultivated as a result of interacting with some type of material. Asthma and air pollution. In fact, there was a wonderful study that showed that people that are exposed to air pollution particulates have greater risk of cardiovascular disease, that these pollutants tend to increase inflammatory markers. Other signs would be things like eczema and psoriasis. Just looking at your skin, looking to see whether or not there's any type of redness or swelling or um, uh, heat. Right. So with eczema, kind of the, the scaling of the skin, the redness of the skin, psoriasis, um, all these types of skin conditions, dermatitis, raised papules on the skin, all denote some form of inflammation. And, of course, like the Time Magazine cover uh, relayed, heart disease, the number one killer in the Western world of both men and women, is, what we now have come to know, an inflammatory process in the body. So now you're probably um, getting a better assessment of, of inflammation in general. So the, um, the, the traditional language for inflammation as we talked about the pain the heat the swelling and the redness and loss of function these all come from these latin names dolor color rubor tumor falesa. so again i think if you can remember these you can start to better assess when you might have inflammation so if there are any questions about that please um, uh, feel free to ask them at this time and and we can and 
discuss that a little bit more. So on from that, um, as many of you know who have been on webinars with me before, I like to look at the medical terminology and the medical rationale for certain diseases as much as I like to look at the symbolic meaning of different diseases and conditions. So let's just think about the symbolic meaning of inflammation just for a second before we start to get into the lifestyle. The very nature of the word inflammation denotes, again, that there's some type of upset or um, perhaps even anger. So I would ask the question many times um, when people come to see me, I like to, again, zoom out and look at the condition more metaphorically and say, what are you inflamed about? What's under your skin? Right? So one of the things that um, we see in the literature is that our attitude, how we live our lives, so, to, to such a great degree determines what happens in our body. And what happens in our body also can influence our mood and also how we live our lives. What about inflammation is that there is a correlation in the literature with pessimism and greater inflammation. So if we walk around in our lives and we're very pessimistic, we see the world with more of a um, half-empty glass type of perspective, and this is very consistent and, and we feel really boxed in by our situation, this may lead to changes within our body physiological changes. There is a true mind-body interaction there. Mind-body medicine interaction is, gosh, that's been studied at, at Harvard and at many other universities. So this is not something that is, is new. This is real science to suggest that there is an interconnection between our psychology and our physiology. Okay, so of inflammation, there are two different types of inflammation for the most part. The first type is acute inflammation, which means that there might be some type of, again, an infection or an injury, and it's very short term. And what happens is that the body recruits its army of different inflammatory messengers to get in there and help clean up the mess and to help recruit the immune system system to do its job. So in a way, inflammation is a good response. It's not to say that inflammation in a proper place is not a healthy response of the body. It can surely be healthy. And so it could be a problem if we do not mount an immune and inflammatory response to an injury. Right? Because those getting those white blood cells to come in and Pair the situation, all of that's very important. The key here is that there is resolution of the inflammation, that eventually, short term, it will go away. Now, the other form of inflammation is the more chronic blue grade inflammation. This is the type of inflammation that's always present, it's always around. And if we have any type of chronic disease, Things like obesity, things like insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, all of these denote inflammation in some way. Now, Rita just asked a very, very good question. She says, are hot flashes signs of inflammation? Oh, <laughs> by the very nature of the term hot flashes, you might start to think that way, right? Um, and in fact, it's very, very interesting, the literature on hot flashes. Um, what we see is that it can be due to many different things, and there seems to be a correlation there with cardiovascular disease. There might be some issue with inflammation in women that are flashing repeatedly many times every day, that there could be some other underlying issue there. So yes, Rita, I would say to answer your question, that hot flashes, menopausal symptoms, is in some way connected to inflammation, or at least has the potential to be if it's not directly. So yeah, there, there's definitely some low-grade inflammation that's involved with multiple uh, different diseases here. And we can add cancer to the list, too. Okay, so another um, term that I'd like you to be aware of is inflammation. 
Okay, so I'd be curious to, to know how many of you have heard of this term. What is inflammating? Now, but by the very nature of this word, you can almost assess what it means, right? Um, it's putting together two different words. One is inflammation and one is aging. So what this denotes, and this term came out some years ago um, by some scientists, is that over time, as we start living longer, and our immune system becomes less robust and less able to react to things in our environment, we are to get more and more inflammation. And what we see is that this inflammation is kind of a very subtle, low-grade form of inflammation that happens throughout the life cycle, more into the aging years, especially as our defense system starts to decline. So something to keep in mind. Um, it's not to say that you can't be healthy as you get older. You surely can. That this whole concept of inflammation or keeping your immune inflammatory system in fine working order is very important. And, of course, we're going to address what you need in order to do that. So um, another thing that I like to do is to look at the Western and the Eastern medical approaches to inflammation because I think there is value in both paradigms. And what's interesting when it comes to inflammation is that both the Western and the Eastern approaches talk about it. In the Western model, and this is the allopathic care, if you went to a medical doctor or even a naturopathic doctor, they might be looking at certain markers in your blood to assess whether or not you have any degree of inflammation. One of the biggest ones that comes up um, is high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Sometimes this is not high sensitivity, sometimes it's just C-reactive protein. But in general, this is a marker that the liver makes when there's inflammation in the body. It's a very ACE-specific marker. So what that means is that if you have a cold or a flu, your HSCRP can increase. So it changes very often, and, and it, probably from day to day, even after bouts of exercise, sometimes that can go up. Other things that um, your doctor might be looking at is oxidized LDL cholesterol. Some have heard of the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol. Well, this is the bad cholesterol. And it's even further, it's kind of the worst cholesterol because it's the type of LDL cholesterol that further gets modified in a detrimental way. And that starts to really uh, become a problem for the, uh, the lining of the arteries, especially when this starts to get into that space and, and you start to get the formation of plaques. High triglycerides or high blood fats can also be a sign of inflammation, especially if it's connected to metabolic syndrome. Changes in white blood cell count, so it denote that there might be some inflammation or infection. Antibodies. So antibodies, these are things in our blood that show we are responding to something in our environment. So we might have been exposed to something, we form antibodies. Sometimes we form autoantibodies, which means that we form antibodies to ourselves, some component of ourselves. <clears throat> may some modified form of our DNA. This is typically what we see in autoimmune disease, where we have lots of inflammation. Also, see high levels of fibrinogen, which is involved in clotting, and high blood glucose. So, for somebody that's a diabetic, having high glucose can also be connected to inflammation. In fact, insulin signaling inside the cell and inflammatory processes, they, they kind of go hand in hand. So, if there is insulin resistance, typically there tends to be inflammation straight away. And tell that just by looking at those biochemical pathways. Now, if, uh, we were talking with a doctor that um, was an Ayurvedic practitioner or was a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. Um, they might tell you that, yes, in, in the, these traditions, they acknowledge things like heat, heat imbalance, looking at kind of the elements in the body and with fire being one of them. In Ayurvedic medicine, they might talk about the pitta dosha. They have different body types, and some are more predisposed to getting more inflamed than others. But we have those doshas in us, and we can still exhibit inflammation, even if we're not a pitta body type. 
So I think it's kind of interesting that inflammation cuts across all disciplines, Western and Eastern. So um, what we're going to talk about is how do you live an anti-inflammatory lifestyle? So that includes things like food, which we are going to focus primarily on. 80% of what we're going to talk about will be on food. We'll talk about activity a little bit, uh, stress, which can really get us inflamed, as well as some other self-care practices. So let's talk about some really subtle, you know, sometimes there's just one little itty-bitty thing that you do to change your life, and it creates a ripple effect. It starts to shift you in other ways. And what I thought is that if you can just take away one of these things from this webinar today and implement it, I wonder how much of a change you'd see if you did have inflammation. So let's just look at some of these little things. Okay, some of them are not subtle. Some of them are, are larger. Something is, is that I think it's very important to get regular checkups with your physician in order to look at some of those markers of inflammation, right? Because unless you're exhibiting the, the redness, the heat, and the pain, and the swelling, you have some underlying chronic inflammaging or inflammatory processes happening that you may not be aware of. You know, many times people have issues even in their mouth, in their jaw, um, that they don't even know about um, until they go to see their periodontist or their dentist. So it's pretty important to stay on the pulse of being connected to your practitioners to assess your markers of inflammation. Now, <laughs> I've been alluding to this whole aspect of the mouth and the teeth. What is really essential, and you'll even find studies on this, is that the mouth is like a microcosm. It's like a little snapshot of your vasculature. It's almost like what's going on in your mouth is a little window into what might be happening in, in the larger expanse of your body. If you keep your mouth healthy by regular tooth brushing and definitely flossing, you can help to eliminate a, a lot of infiltration of bacteria. Because think about it, you eat meal, you've got all that food sitting in your teeth, and what tends to happen is that if you're not taking care of them, it just kind of sits there, of course you've got bacteria in your mouth. And so that can change the overall flora or the changes, um, whether it's in pH in the mouth or you can start to see infiltration of of different bacterial factors into your system. I think it's very, very important to floss even after every meal. And so I have a couple of uh, packages of floss that I just keep with me in my purse, in my bag, um, in my car, everywhere, because it's, just, it's pretty amazing um, how I personally have even tracked my own health by keeping my teeth healthy. I, I definitely make time to go to the dentist twice a year, um, get my teeth cleaned. Um, with, with, I were going to a lecture by a physician by the name of Dr. Stephen Gundry, and he's a cardiovascular surgeon. So I never anticipated hearing something about teeth from a cardiovascular surgeon, but I remember him saying that by flossing, what he observed in his patients was that by flossing every other day, that that helped to reduce that C-reactive protein, an inflammatory marker, by 50%. That amazing that just flossing teeth can reduce inflammation so dramatically. So I think that's a big one. Even if that's your takeaway to get um, brushing your teeth and flossing, that, <laughs> that's very important. Um, the other one is moderate activity. And notice that I use the word moderate. In fact, it was just a study that came out, I believe just on Thursday this past week, showing that people that were moderately walking had the same benefit in terms of their cardiovascular system, which of course is connected to inflammation, as did the vigorous runners. So you know, many times we always think we have to uh, work more vigorously, harder, push ourselves, but maybe it leads to more inflammation in the body. Maybe what we need to do is just have the low-level, moderate activity where, yeah, we, we get our heart rate up a little bit, but not to the level where we're feeling 
in the face, right? Lots of sweat, um, where we can't move after being very active. I think it's important to, to note the level of activity. As much as you can, reduce the toxin burden in your environment. Now, Metabolic detoxification is so important. Your liver, your skin, your lungs, your gut, your kidneys are all working to, in your lymph. So many different organs are working together to get things out of your body. You take things in. You, uh, your body is programmed to, to move things out. So you can make it easier on your body if you're already checking things in your environment and start to reduce those things. So what might those things be? Well, they could be things like um, endocrine disruptors in your personal care products, right? So reading the labels of your personal care products very carefully because uh, if, if you're applying these things every day and you start seeing inflammation of your skin, maybe not even of your skin, it could be something internal, but it's because we're connecting to these things on the outside. Maybe it's even toxins in your food, in your air, in your water, so many different things that you can do. Uh, if you can't move uh, and you're, you live in a very polluted city, trying as best you can to get an air purifier at home, and you can to reduce that toxin burden will be significant. Another aspect is to exercise forgiveness. So you do any activity, um, <laughs> aside from the physical activity, another great one would be, um, indeed, to really be sincere about um, um, give apologies. And the reason why I mention this is because there's been some really nice research showing that when people forgive in a sincere way, that that apology benefits not only the person giving it, but all the person receiving it. It's like a win-win. And it helps to reduce some of these markers that are connected to the cardiovascular system, right? Connected to the heart, again, tying in with inflammation. The key here is that the research shows that the apology must be sincere. If it's sincere, it can actually fuel more inflammation and anger. So that's the key to that one. All right. Um, the other one is to try meditation and mindfulness. Lots of great studies showing that you can reduce inflammatory markers just by taking time to still. Uh, whether that's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if that seems like too much to you, just starting with three minutes, maybe that's your small takeaway from tonight. Okay. Implement proper sleep hygiene. Um, sleep is restorative, and I think that the reason why we're becoming so inflamed is because we're not getting enough of the yin or the nourishing or the quieting aspects in our lives. We're always doing, we're on the go, everything is young. We're putting out so much energy and effort. So when it comes to sleep, it's so important not to sell ourselves short there. We don't want to get less than seven or greater than nine is what the National Sleep Foundation would tell you, that seven to nine hours is really kind of that sweet spot of um, the, the amount of sleep that we need for restoration. And if we're sleeping too little, this could definitely uh, play into inflammatory markers. Finally, um, before we get into the food, is to be positive in speech and actions. And again, that goes back to the research that I showed you that relates to pessimism versus optimism being connected to inflammation. It actually increases a blood marker called interleukin-6, which is a, um, an inflammatory cytokine in the body just by being negative or pessimistic. Of course, what you're here for is can you eat more of these anti-inflammatory foods? So let's get to the food aspect here. So let's imagine what is high. In order for you to know what's anti-inflammatory, you first need to know what is inflammatory. So here's a snapshot of a high inflammatory diet. So here we go. Uh, and you can probably already think of a couple of things. The big one that I see many people engaging in is high heat cooking and frying. Anytime you get the production of brown on foods, whether it's meats, beans, 
vegetables, you name it. Um, what we're doing is the, the formation of those browning products, which in food science we call Meilliard, that's a Meilliard reaction protein and carbohydrate under the presence of heat, forming that brown color. That's what happens when we take bread and we put it in the toaster, right? We're actually getting more inflammatory compounds browning process. So trying to reduce as much of that high heat cooking and frying as possible is really important. Another factor of, an, of a high inflammation diet is high glycemic index and high glycemic load. What that means is that these are the high sugary foods that are going to spike your blood sugar. And I already spoke about how blood sugar is connected to inflammation. So, of course, anything that you're eating that's going to be very sugary is going to lead to those changes. Poor quality trans fats are also very inflammatory. So if you're eating a lot of processed foods that are full of these shelf-stable, partially hydrogenated oils, these are really the, the, the monster dietary fat. They're really the worst. Um, they increase your bad cholesterol and they decrease your good cholesterol. So make sure that you get um, none of these trans fats, if at all possible. And you find them in a lot of processed foods. My inflammation diet is also pretty low in color. And what I think of there is brown, yellow, and white foods. Not always, um, but typically very low in color. Also, high allergenic foods. Think of the immune system and how it's coupled very tightly to the inflammatory process in the body. If you are continually taking in foods that engage your immune system in a negative way and every time you eat you feel sick because you're creating some type of an immune inflammatory response, just by eliminating those foods, you can clear up a lot of inflammatory noise. So the top eight allergens, um, you know, things like eggs and soy and peanuts and dairy products, um, many times tree nuts, although that's not for everybody, and shellfish as another example. As I mentioned, high sugar, high added sugar intake is also going to be a problem. For those of you seeing my screen, you're going to see um, a face on a plate with two eyes being the donuts and then the fried chicken in the middle, kind of looking like the nose, and then the french fries for the mouth. So this meal right here, high in inflammatory potential. You can only imagine uh, that somebody time after time would not feel good, or even the first time if they're very sensitive with body after eating this. Top 12 foods to avoid are sugar, which we've already talked about. A lot of the cooking oils um, that especially are not from organic seeds or plants. So corn oil, cottonseed oil, safflower, soy oil, sunflower oils, all these oils, especially when used in the presence of heat, um, can be very inflammatory in the body. They're loaded with a fatty acid that can convert to more inflammation in the body, especially if it's not balanced. It's really more about the balance of these quality fats. I already mentioned uh, trans fats. That's number three. Um, number four, dairy products. Many times dairy, if it's not good quality dairy, meaning that if it's not hormone um, if it's not organic, if it's not from uh, cows that were fed organic food, you might tend to have more issues with inflammation, increasing things like uh, insulin growth factor one and, and other issues. So that's been a food that many people seem to react to. Five, white flour and refined grains. And I'm sure that you're aware of all of the, well, the predominance of gluten intolerance and um, how so many people now are not able to process grains. And when I think of gluten, I think of the acronym BROWS, right? That's one, one easy way to remember which grains have gluten. Barley, rye, oats, for the most part, get contaminated. You can get gluten-free oats, but oats can be contaminated with gluten. Wheat and spelt, so those are the more common ones. 
Next uh, is alcohol. And if we think about cancer, there's definitely a connection there between certain types of cancer and the consumption of alcohol. I, I think about the studies on breast cancer, showing the connection between alcohol consumption and increased breast cancer incidence. Uh, I've talked about number seven, which is bone fried foods. Number eight, red and processed meat. Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit because there's some disclaimers on that one. For the most part, if you've got highly processed or browned meat, uh, red meat that has been cooked and um, maybe not from the best source, that can be inflammatory. And also because so much depends on what that cow was fed. Right? If the cow is being fed corn or grain products, well, what's going to happen with the meat? Those products, that food, will translate into the tissue of the cow and that makes it a little bit more inflammatory. So I'll talk about what the disclaimers are on that, and you might be surprised with something that I say later. Number nine, synthetic sweeteners. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of artificial sweeteners. Things like sucralose and saccharin and um, ACE-K and all these different sweeteners because they can't be changing up the metabolic function in our body. And in fact, there's already some studies to suggest that uh, we might be changing up um, somebody's response or ability to burn calories based on these synthetic sweeteners. So to me, that denotes that there could be an inferred indirect into inflammation. I've already talked about gluten um, and I already mentioned the different type of gluten grains. Number 11, white potatoes. Why do I say white potatoes here? Well, because white potatoes tend to be high in sugar, high in starch, and so this provokes a glycemic response in the blood. 12. Now, number 12, um, I put on here nightshades. Nightshades are a certain classification of of a plant or a vegetable, sometimes a fruit, like tomatoes, which can be a fruit or a vegetable in some people's eyes. But these nightshades, eggplant, um, bell peppers, tomatoes, um, they tend to be inflammatory for certain people. So everybody, and you kind of have to feel out whether or not that you would go into that category. But what I have seen clinically is that people with joint inflammation or arthritis um, as in some way, shape, or form, seem to have more inclination to be sensitive towards nightshades. So now you're probably thinking, okay, Deanna, you just told me what not to eat. What do I eat now? So here are the top 10 foods based on um, the research that I've been looking into. Number one, wild salmon. Absolutely two thumbs up. Up. What I love about it is that um, wild salmon, now I'm going to put a little disclaimer on this though too, wild salmon tends to be um, high in omega-3 fatty acids and omega-3 fatty acids tend to be anti-inflammatory, kind of the opposite of some of the fatty acids that you might find in some of those uh, vegetable oils, which would have more omega-6 and less omega-3. That kind of depends on the oil. Now, the only disclaimer on this one is that, um, of course, some, of the, some salmon is going to be higher in things like mercury. Methyl mercury levels are, are higher in, in salmon grown in, or, or, uh, in, in certain parts of the, uh, the ocean. So you have to watch for that. that, that typically, um, you can negate some of the good effects of wild salmon uh, because of the levels of methyl mercury. So in the I've presented... Um, as, as part of the, the webinar series at Harmony Hills, some of the, the different fish that are higher in mercury than others. The way to go to to get that information, now salmon tends to be pretty mild to moderate, but there are other fish like tuna uh, that tends to be higher. So the website is www.ewg.org, ewg.org, Environmental Working Group. Okay, two, grass-fed beef. Oh, my goodness, can you believe that I'm saying this? <laughs> um, in fact, there is some really nice literature showing that when people are fed fatty beef versus 
grass-fed um, lean beef that they have a reduced um, postprandial response, a reduced response of lipids or the fats that are in the blood after a meal. And so much depends on what that animal was fed. In the case of beef, um, if we're giving it grass, if we're giving the cow grass, that tends to be higher in the uh, omega-3 fats. Okay, unfiltered, what's EVOO? Well, extra virgin olive oil. And what I like to say is that the cloudy olive oil, it almost looks dirty if you look at it, right? All those um, olive polyphenols that are swimming around in that olive oil have been shown to be very anti-inflammatory and even cardioprotective, protective for the heart. So <clears throat> making sure that you have not just the cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil, but the unfiltered as well. You want those olive bees um, in your oil. Or, and I've definitely talked about cruciferous vegetables before in talking about cancer, definitely anti-inflammatory. And these vegetables will help you to reduce any kind of toxin burden inside your body by helping the liver to work better. Knives, organic blueberries. I include their blackberries, any of the small, dark blue berries. I like the small ones um, because they tend to be um, lower in sugar and higher in that skin. And it's the skin that contains the anthocyanidins that are anti-inflammatory. I mean, the, just looking at them, you know, the cool blueberry, um, what we see is that they help to reduce inflammation in the body and in particular um, helpful with a lot of the different brain functions like learning and memory favorites. In fact, um, just this morning for breakfast, I had this number six uh, one, turmeric. I'm a fan of turmeric. Uh, in fact, what I had for breakfast was um, I had some red potatoes, small red potatoes, not the big white starchy white potatoes, but I had small red potatoes cubed up. I had sprouted tofu, um, and I, I put those two together with um, Symbols. I put broccoli, spinach, red bell pepper, and I, I used some olive oil and uh, a very hard shake of turmeric. And I made this type of curry for, for my breakfast dish. We know that turmeric is very helpful for reducing inflammation. In fact, probably more than anything on this list, it really probably should be at the top of this list if I'm doing them in that order because it's so concentrated, because it works so well. And you hear about this even in uh, Eastern medical traditions. Well, kind of the partner to turmeric is ginger. And one of my favorite things to make, I'm going to share a recipe with you, is the hot turmeric milkshake, um, in which I include turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg. Oh, my goodness, it's wonderful. And I'll show you that recipe as we get towards the, uh, the end here. Garlic is also great. Um, it's great not just because it reduces inflammation, but it uh, retires into antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial effects. Gris is a, another great one because it contains these important catechins. And believe it or not, I wonder how many of you would, would have thought, I would say, sweet potatoes. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to share with you um, one of the inflammatory factor ratings for sweet potato, which tends to be um, the anti-inflammatory. And in fact, if you think about it, um, even on some very extreme elimination diets, have lamb, one of the least allergenic meats, together with sweet potato, is often thought to be um, a very good combination. I show you some other perspectives on anti-inflammatory eating. So the pyramid here, uh, for those of you seeing my screen, this comes from Dr. Andy Wiles' um, website, and he talks about anti-inflammatory foods in the context of a pyramid. So working up from the bottom to the top, and I'll just go through these very quickly, he has vegetables four to five a day minimum, but raw and cooked, all parts of the color spectrum. I love that he says that. Organic when possible. He also has fruits at the bottom, three to four a day. Frozen or frozen, organic when possible. And up from fruits and vegetables, which, again, forming the base of that pyramid, 
Peanut, whole and cracked grains, pasta, beans, and legumes. So um, not sure I entirely agree with him with uh, so many grains, three to five per day, but I do agree with uh, probably a couple times a, a week and then instituting more beans and legumes on a daily basis to get more protein and fiber. Healthy fats, he's got a number of different ones here, extra virgin olive oil. He has a stellar press canola oil. Now, the disclaimer on that one, I would say, is just any canola oil because um, canola is actually made from rapeseed, uh, and much of the rapeseed, especially that is grown in Canada um, and maybe in other parts too, uh, tends to be uh, genetically modified. So you definitely want to be sure that you're getting organic canola oil if you choose to use that. And canola oil is not a, a bad oil. It's, um, it tends to be higher in omega-3, so that's good. But you don't use a lot of high heat with it because that will destroy some of those good healthy oils. Fish and seafood, he's got those on there. He's got whole soy foods, so things like edamame, soy nuts, soy milk, tofu, and tempeh. He's got cooked Asian mushrooms, which can um, really be helpful for modulating the immune response. And we're going to talk more about the immune system when we get together again in June. Other sorts of protein, he's got a number of different forms of protein on here, high-quality natural cheeses and yogurt, omega-3 enriched eggs, skinless poultry, lean meats, one to two a week. He has herbs and spices on there in unlimited amounts. I would absolutely agree with him. He's got tea, white, green, and oolong, two to four cups a day. Now, the only thing I would note there is, if at all possible, um, choosing the decaffeinated varieties because in two to four cups a day that could stack up to a lot of caffeine believe it or not depending on the form of green tea used he also has up at the top there uh, red wine optional healthy sweets such as dark chocolate sparingly okay so that's his system there's another system that I think is pretty intriguing it's called the inflammation factor rating system and this is put out by uh, Monica, Monica Renegal nutritionist and what she did is she rated dudes and, and created a scale so foods that have a very strong anti-inflammatory effect have a ring greater than 200 if it has a moderate anti-inflammatory effect it's between 100 to 200 and mild effects would be between 0 to 100 if it goes into the negative that means that they're inflammatory so let me take you through a tour of what she considers to be um, high in, in inflammation. So anything above 200 is thought to be strongly anti-inflammatory. So she has a whole book based on this system. And some of the features that make a food anti-inflammatory, according to her, all of these factors to create this reading, would be type of fats that are in the food, the amount of vitamins, the minerals, the antioxidants. He's also looking at low glycemic load, which again is very important as we discussed, and looking at any type of anti-inflammatory phytochemicals. All right, so let's see which ones uh, she says are good. One of the ones is um, cooked fish, which I already mentioned. So um, she gives many reasons as to why cold water fish um, are important. So three ounces of cooked fish um, on a daily basis, or at least um, if we're just assessing, not on a daily basis, but just in, in terms of what amount to um, to measure. So if you look at the inflammation factor readings for fish, um, and again, anything above 200 is considered to be wrongly anti-inflammatory. So if you look at her list here, she's got up at the way top, uh, cod liver oil, one tablespoon, 1,137. <laughs> of course, that's a supplement, right? That's not something that you're getting from food. Chovies, canned in oil, 871. So, wow, that's very anti-inflammatory in, in her opinion there. Uh, wild salmon, she scores very high at 489. Sardines uh, at 435. Whitefish. 422 and oysters, raw oysters, 310. Also puts green vegetables high in that list because uh, they've got uh, 
um, carotene, vitamin K, folate, B6, lots of antioxidants. And so what we see for green vegetables is often neck and neck score here between kale and spinach. So K227, spinach 224, and from there we see um, drawing into the, the moderate um, in inflammation, anti-inflammatory activity. But still, still good. Vegetables, and this is where we get into things like sweet potato. So one of the highest orange vegetables that she rated was sweet potato at 189. Carrots were also high, but not as high as sweet potato. Winter squash and pumpkin, uh, they were more um, in the mild range, but but definitely anti-inflammatory. Nuts at a quarter of a cup. So things like Brazil nuts, um, and it's primarily because of the healthy fats and also the vitamin E that nuts contain. So if we look at the, the ratings here, Brazil nuts are at 170, Minia nuts 159, hazelnuts 125, and then almonds dipping down to 64. So all of them are anti-inflammatory, just a little bit more on some of the, the top nuts there. No unsaturated fats, so those are the oils like the olive oil that we were talking about. Um, she does put organic canola oil on her list, as we've talked about, um, and also extra virgin olive oil and avocados, all of which are anti-inflammatory. Spices. You know, uh, we have talked about spices before at uh, Harmony Hill. I did a whole webinar, I believe that was in November, if you're interested in listening to it, but um, lots of good antioxidants, anti-inflammatory compounds, whether it's capsaicin and carotenoids found in the hot peppers, the gingerols, those are compounds found in ginger, helps with the production of inflammatory molecules, curcumin, which is in turmeric, right? That's what gives turmeric its bright yellow color, very anti-inflammatory. Allicin, which is a compound in garlic, also helps to protect against oxidative stress and inflammation. And finally, uh, one of the ones that we did not talk about, but I think it's a fascinating uh, plant, is parsley. So dried parsley, the spice, uh, can help to increase the antioxidant capacity of the blood. It's a source of vitamin C and vitamin K. So if we get some of these spices, they really top the chart. So raw ginger, one tablespoon, is 387, again, all above that 200 mark. Also, ginger powder, just half of a teaspoon, we see 276. Onions, half a cup, 240. Pepper, up at the top there, half of a teaspoon, 282. So one of the, maybe this is your takeaway, the small takeaway, is to include more spices for anti-inflammatory effect and flossing your teeth. <laughs> okay, other notable foods with anti-inflammatory effects, half a cup, um, think cantaloupe, guava, papaya, strawberries. Strawberries are great because they contain this compound uh, fisetin, which can help with inflammation. Tomatoes, if you're not sensitive to nightshades. Red peppers, if you're not sensitive to nightshades. Um, pineapple, lemon juice, and of course, the, all of the aromatic herbs. Now, as I mentioned to you, the surprise anti-inflammatory food uh, is beef tenderloin. And these effects become, it's a very lean meat if you eat meat. You know, uh, we've talked a lot about the incorporation of meat into the diet and trying to regulate and minimize that if at all possible. So perhaps if you are a meat eater, when you do select, select the, the better cuts that are less inflammatory and also from organically raised cows, right, they're grass-fed, would be much, much better. Here's a, a, just basically a study from 2010 indicating that grass-fed beef compared to beef that's grain-fed, um, Overall, just less fat content and more omega-3s, more of another type of fat called conjugated linoleic acid, which is a, a, a healthy fat. 
um, bit more beta carotene, more vitamin E, more antioxidants in general. And in fact, um, there was another article in 2011 that showed that platelet concentrations of omega-3 fats were significantly higher in people who ate grass-fed beef compared to those that ate grain-fed beef. So who would have thought, right, that beef could ever be anti-inflammatory? Oh, I'm going to whisk you through some recipe ideas. Um, lots of different ideas here, and I've asked Victrina if if we can send out an email afterwards because I have a whole list of recipes to share with you um, as a gift for coming onto the webinar today. So no need to take notes on this because we're going to go through these fairly quickly and, and you'll have that in the handout. So there are a lot of different menu um, items here. So one of them is Swiss chard with red peppers. Mm. So taking that Swiss chard and maybe even mixing it with um, kale, and uh, just kind of lightly wilting it, adding some garlic. You know, healthy eating doesn't have to be sophisticated. We don't even need recipes. Once we know the foods to work with, it's a lot easier just to start putting things together and using your creativity. So another one, wilted spinach and adding in some garlic and some, uh, some other seasoning or spice, like the red pepper flakes or cayenne um, or maybe... Um, some other types of spices would be good, too, even something like oregano. Tate mustard greens, again, very, very simple. And with mustard greens, uh, because it is pretty spicy, uh, you don't need a lot of other seasonings. But it states here in the, the recipe, to increase the anti-inflammatory effect, include sautéed onions and curry powder to taste. So I might even try to... Uh, neutralize some of that very spicy taste of the mustard greens by including some of the other um, spices. Um, Eastern parsley salad. We just got through talking about parsley. Baked potato wedges. This is so incredibly easy, and as I just mentioned, uh, with sweet potatoes being relatively anti-inflammatory, um, here's what I do. Here's an example of actual ones that I've made. You take a sweet potato, slice and, and cut them up um, and uh, essentially douse them in a mixture of oil and uh, turmeric. Um, so by kind of bam in this, then you put them in the oven and just get them a little bit soft and you can eat them as kind of like wilty fries actually. But they go really nicely with uh, things like salmon or um, maybe even a chicken breast recipe, winter squash with shallots, garlic and hazelnuts, again, easy. Sweet potato chickpea mustard green soup, good. And lots of different um, anti-inflammatory compounds there. Butternut squash soup, red lentils. And uh, if you don't have this, this is one of the, the tools that I love um, that helps me to live more of an anti-inflammatory lifestyle and and eat in a way is I just happen to, to get, and you can get a Vitamix, they have Blendtec, we have different food pulverizers. I have the Nutribullet just because it's, it's nice, it's just a single serve and it's very easy to clean. So that's something that I use um, to make things like uh, juices with greens and lemon and apple and lime. Uh, this is the hot turmeric milkshake recipe that. Uh, I've actually changed it a little bit from what you see here. I basically take coconut water, I put in some almonds, and you can use almond meal or uh, just regular raw almonds. I put in some dates as the sweetener. I put in turmeric, cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg. I, I, I do the cloves, but you can do the cloves. And I also put in a little bit of melted uh, coconut oil. So a number of things, and I, I put them in the blender, blend it up, and yes, it does have a yellow-orange color, <laughs> but it's really good, and it does hold your your um, appetite for, for some hours. Here's our um, smoothie recipe, C, anti-inflammatory smoothie recipe, and this is coming from the website that I'm listed at the bottom. One cup of green tea, adding in blueberries, papaya chunks, chia seeds, turmeric, ginger, cayenne pepper, cinnamon, um, and then you can also add in some other things uh, as well. Things like cherries, 
tend to be anti-inflammatory. So did in um, fresh or frozen pitted cherries. Here's a, a sample of a photograph of a, um, this is a key lime avocado pie that I made. And if you look really close, notice that that crust is not what you're probably used to. It's made from nuts. Um, in fact, I've uh, given this recipe to Harmony Hill, and they have this. They make this at their retreat center. The middle is avocado and a lot of lime juice. And a little bit of, uh, I, I always reduce the, the sweetener, but I use a little bit of maple syrup uh, just to give it some sweetness. And also dates. I use dates to, to really um, amp up the sweetness if I need to. And there are dates and nuts in the crust along with some coconut flour. Very easy to make and actually very tasty. And you can fool people with that. So I'm doing how um, making nut crust, putting it in the pie shell, and food processor, I put together the avocado and a lot of the lime juice, which helps to prevent the avocado from turning brown, too, because it contains vitamin C. Another example of uh, just something quick to toss together, so red cabbage, or purple cabbage with some broccoli, and a lot of those root vegetables, keep them in your kitchen. They are so important for reducing inflammation. All right, so I'd like to thank you. Um, I see that we, we've got a number of questions that I uh, kind of saw coming through, so I'm going to take some time to address those. So let's see here. Okay, so um, let's see if that has a question. What are examples of bad brown and yellow foods? Um, okay. So brown foods, um, and what I'm thinking here is more along the lines of foods that have been fried or kind of um, maybe it's toast, you know, something that is uh, where it's had heat applied and turns even more brown. Um, things like I showed in the picture, things like cookies and donuts, which are kind of pan, I, I suppose. But uh, in general, the, the foods that – we already probably know intuitively are not very good for us. Um, when it comes to yellow foods, and, and that's why I said, um, as I said it, that brown, yellow, and white foods, not all, but for the majority, if, if we're thinking processed, overly processed foods, uh, some of the yellow foods might be something like uh, a lot of corn products, corn chips, as an example, right? Corn already is, is pretty uh, inflammatory. Can't, we don't have it in balance. Um, so if, if we're in lots of, of corn, um, that can be an issue. Okay, here's another question. All right, so, so Faith, your question was about soy and not good for certain types of breast cancer. Um, yes, just so, and you know, that goes definitely um, any time that, uh, you know, these webinars are educational, they're not prescriptive. You always need to check with your practitioner about what foods that you need to be eating if you have cancer or certain other chronic diseases. So um, something to, to assess definitely with your practitioner if you have an estrogen sensitive cancer that might respond to some of the phytoestrogens. And keep in mind that soy is not the only phytoestrogenic food. Um, there are a number of things in our food supply that uh, have these phytoestrogen effects. And I think that the problem comes in in a lot of the processed soy, right, that the non-GMO um, or the, the GMO soy that's out there in, 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 in very invasive in our food supply. Okay, so Vered is also on the line. Wonderful. So um, she's saying about, okay, I think this was in reference to talking about the collard greens or a lot of the different green products, that they contain something called oxalic acid. That's true. Um, so people that um, have sensitivity from a kidney perspective and, and might be prone to oxalic acid uh, stones, to definitely um, uh, to monitor the, the consumption of these green foods. Um, so, and that's, you know, that's not a large percentage of people, but if that's something that um, is definitely part of your health history, you definitely want to monitor the intake. And then, um, 
Uh, and the question here, how do you know if you have a sensitivity to nightshade foods? Well, one example would be think of the different body treatments, right? And everybody kind of has their weak body part or they tend to get a symptom if they're reacting. Um, for some people, it's joints. For myself, it's joints. So if I'm eating something and I don't think it has gluten in it and later on I feel my joints aching, I start thinking to myself, what did I just eat that had gluten? So in the case of nightshades, um, some signs of sensitivity might be joint aches after eating a meal. That could either be uh, immediately or delayed. Uh, it could also be skin issues. You might get hives or swelling or some type of weakness. Again, back to the inflammation. Again, looking for these inflammatory signs in us that we started with to denote whether or not we have a sensitivity. So that could also be any kind of gut or gastrointestinal disturbances. Um, uh, so, Trina, okay, you had a question about probiotics. Would that help to boost your immune system? That's a very good point and uh, question. Probiotics, what they're doing is they're helping to restore the integrity of the gut lining. So when our gut lining is, is healthy and solid and not porous and leaky, we're able to better defend ourselves from invaders uh, so that every time we eat, we're having this kind of inflammatory reaction. Because for some people, when they eat, they, they tend to get this feeling inflamed, feeling sick, feeling tired after a meal. Feeling tired could also denote some degree of sensitivity uh, as well. So I think that probiotics are wonderful as being um, part of an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. So thank you all very much for being here tonight. And uh, don't forget to get us your email so that I can send out to you a living of all of those uh, anti-inflammatory recipes, and we'll get that out to you as, as soon as we can. Uh, feel free to email me with, with questions uh, at dina at foodandspirit.com. I also post, uh, as well as Harmony Hill does this as well, we both have Facebook pages, so we like to post uh, tips on there for, for all of you. Again, thank you so much for being here tonight, taking time, and I, I wish you well in uh, living your anti-inflammatory lifestyle. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.